Hey everybody, wheelchair gunfighter. Um, I want to do a part two of initial wheelchair considerations for concealed carry. I want to do it a part two anyway, but I've since, just since a few days ago, I've had a lot of questions um, about more nuanced stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and cover some of the stuff that I wanted to say in part two, and I will try to get to as many questions as possible. If not, I'll do a part three. Um, but I don't I don't want this to be an hour-long video, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, oh, first and foremost, Gurkha, um, Hudson Bay Reds, guys. Okay, <clears throat> so I don't really have any delicate way of addressing this issue, but there's a, there's a whole lot of misconception about what I think is possible for self-defense in the wheelchair. And I know that a lot of people will be like, oh, you can do anything if you, you know, put your mind to it or whatever. No. <laughs> Being in a wheelchair is a massive tactical disadvantage. Um, and I, and I, I, when I use the word tactical, um, consider that categorical. You could say it's a categorical disadvantage. Um, the way I use the word tactic is, is categories, whole categories of tactical subsets. Okay? So categorically, it is a disadvantage. It affects a number of tactical imperatives that must be fulfilled for a um, high chance of systemic success, meaning all of the tactical uh, requirements needed to for the, all the stars to align for ta for a high degree of success, mobility affects a lot of them. It affects your ability to affect the center of gravity of a of a fight, whether that's the metaphysical um, the uh, theoretical uh, center of the body of the whole battle, if you will, or the center of gravity of a human being in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, either one, it doesn't matter. Um, yes, small scale, large scale, you can't control the center of gravity of a fight. Your ability to trap your opponent via maneuver, i.e. fix him in place, whether that's taking it, um, advantage of environment or via your uh, your ability to maneuver around someone else's fixed position. It doesn't matter, it's non-existent. Um, your ability to flank, uh, just being able to, well, I mean, maneuver at all. Um, yes, I covered in my Get Off the X video, you can, you can, you can apply some hand-to-hand -hand mechanism to temporarily, in the immediate contact, um, force someone's flank to you. Um, what I did not cover in that video is that is a temporary solution. A temporary solution in a very rapidly changing environment. Now, typically when we're talking about tactical imperatives and what it what it means to overcome one thing or the, you know, someone attacks you and they have a significant tactical advantage in one particular area. You can typically overcome that by temporarily, i.e. in response to that tactical advantage, um, via another aspect, a successful tactical application, um, overcome that. So, you, so what they're, they're outmaneuvering you. You apply a different uh, tactical imperative like disparity of force. Um, that could be a high level of violence or, hey, buddy, come over here and help me. Now there's two on one. Um, that would be disparity of force. Um, throwing some kind of psychological wrench in their gears. Uh, you know, you drop a flashbang out of your pocket and it startles them. It throws a wrench in their plans and now you have a psychological advantage. Um, we would call that um, uh, manipulation of uh, perception. Uh, regardless, without throwing, you know, doing, having an equal, or sorry, a greater application of one of the different imperatives, a different one of the imperatives, um, there's not really a way to overcome that. Um, I 
furthermore, there has to be a follow-up. So that's only good, you know, that initial shock and awe, whatever, you know, uh, tactical advantage that you pull out of your, your hat to overcome that initial ambush. It has to be followed up with the ability to take overall tactical command of the fight until the fight is over. Um, otherwise, you have this, you know, this person has this advantage, this person has this advantage, and it's a crapshoot with a whole bunch of X factors in the middle until somebody, by luck of the X factors, wins. Or you both end up in the hospital, or, you know, you both lose, it, in, in other words. Um, I know this being super general, but that's that's why I push. Okay, that's why I push handguns or concealed carry handguns um, for wheelchair users so hard, um, because there's this kind of mis I don't know, call it a misconception. Um, I, there's not a whole lot to call it. You know, there there's a lot of argument that I'm gonna oh I'm from the wheelchair I'm gonna use a high degree of hand to hand skill and that will overcome somehow, magically, multiple attackers. Um, or I'm going to, you know, pull a knife, you know, and this is my, you know, meat skinning knife, by the way. But, uh, you know, I'm going to pull my knife and I'm going to be able to do, you know, just as much as I can with a handgun. And I've also heard this argument from, from, a, from a moral perspective. Because you do have to make the moral argument before you make the efficiency argument. Um, you know, I just couldn't bring myself to shoot somebody as if stabbing them is less horrific somehow. Uh, all that says to me is that you've never done this or this, and you not understand the nature of the thing. Um, but at least that person's having the moral discussion with themselves, if you want to call it that. But somehow, anyway, somehow there's this thought that I can somehow do this, and that's going to overcome a massive tactical disadvantage of mobility disparity is what we'll call it. So let's break it down by the numbers. Something like this, or I pull this out, or I have some other form of I have some other form of contact weapon. What do I have to be able to do? I have to be able to touch them. So, that means that we have to be within equal or very close to mutual touching range. So, any ability I, I might have had with something else to manage the distance um, in my favor, right? Negating their ability, their, their mobility advantage, I don't have. So now we're touching, we're at touching range they have the ability to move away from me. I don't have the ability, the ability to chase them. So if at any point they realize that I'm doing damage to them by touching them, even by superior skill, they have the ability to manage the distance away from me and find in their immediate environment or from their own person that they already had some tool at which they can reach me without me reaching them. That's why we always put distance management at the very top of the list for tactical imperatives. Because even more so than maneuver, the ability to reach out and touch someone before they can touch you is going to start to break down the institution, right? Whether it's one body or an army, when you can start to diminish their ability to fight sooner, i.e. further away, by the time that you reach contact or make contact, or maybe it's so it's so effective that they never even make contact, which in the case of civilian self-defense and uh, concealed carry, is the ideal. They have the they have a massive tactical advantage, and then second to that is maneuver. Ergo, if I can't maneuver, but I can reach out and touch them, by the numbers. I can, in many circumstances, not all, because remember, all these tactical imperatives, um, if you've had my class or you at least got a snippet of it in what the Tactical Foundations video, by the numbers, I can have, often, a, an advantage. I can overcome that maneuver um, aspect. 
That doesn't happen if I have to physically touch them first. So categorically, we have a problem if our only means of self-protection means that I have to completely allow them to come out, come in to my range. Now, if you, I have made this argument before, if you have the, a, a good core control and you have a lot of upper body strength and you can you have the degree of skill where you can bait them in and keep them there for a significant amount of time, you can make some stuff work sometimes. That is not something you know, I don't have, I have full core control. I have a lot of upper body strength. I can do a lot of that stuff. I've been doing martial arts almost as long as I've been alive. I'm not relying on that. Period. So, you can argue with that, but I can, it's, an easy thing to disprove any day of the week in the lab. Just the, the mobility thing is a very hard thing to get around. Um, for every reason. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's just no getting around it. Um, if you want to argue that further, I'm happy to have a discussion about it, but the end of the day, you're, I mean, we, we can break it down by the numbers, and it's going to lose out to distance management every time. Um, so if you're giving that up, I don't know I don't know what else to say to you. Okay, back to handgun stuff. Um, again, most of these considerations when you're talking about initial considerations for concealed carry, you know, uh, either first getting a gun or, you know, going through the process of making it a lifestyle for the first time, most of these considerations Everybody does. Everybody considers most of these categories. What I'm trying to do is point out why the differences matter from the wheelchair. And maybe the, you know, with something that's, that's true for an able-bodied person or better for an able-bodied person may not be so if you're in a wheelchair. And I'll explain why. So if you're first considering carrying a weapon one of the biggest things you're going to find online, probably first and foremost, is what caliber do I get? And this this is one of those things that's beaten to ag, you know ad nauseum. You can go look up all the science on handgun wounding mechanics on your own. That's covered in extent elsewhere. What I want to point out is that, tactically speaking, Accurate volume of fire is a key component for winning gunfights. I didn't say volume of fire. We're not talking about military covering fire over a wide area or anything like that. Accurate volume of fire. That is, numbers of rounds and speed of rounds fired. That is a key winning component of any gunfight. That's why machine guns went out over bolt-action rifles. Um, it's just there's the simple that's the simplest term I can put it in. So you want to be able to fire a lot of rounds reliably in succession accurately. Um, do with that piece of information what you want. It's there. Um, remember also from the wheelchair you're firing likely one-handed. So lower recoil within the parameters of, you know, accepted self-defense calibers is probably going to do you better uh, because you're going to be able to fire more rounds more, uh, in, in shorter succession, right? This can be much more prominent one-handed. It's going to be much more prominent when you don't have a, 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 a solid bone structure behind the firearm um, with which to launch rounds, uh, with which to keep the recoil down, to manage it. Um, so this is one of those circumstances where you want the machine, if you can, to supplement for any shortcomings that you bring to the fight physically. Um, anything on any the other? Oh, yes. So um, the flip side of that, 
uh, again, I said within the, within the parameters of um, accepted self-defense calibers, I will say that it's... It, I, okay, a lot of wheelchair users I've noticed carry smaller guns that are rather low, uh, one would argue poor calibers. I have to argue against this for two reasons. One, lower calibers, particularly below 380. I argue 380 as well, but I'll let you have it. Below 380, the wounding mechanics are just not sufficient enough. Two, there's an ex an accepted uh, there's like a known amount of of grime and grit, um, water that can get into a handgun, and most people that of experience expect the gun to keep running. This can happen by total accident. If you hit the ground, it's raining, whatever. If your chances of falling out of your wheelchair or being thrown from your wheelchair is in civilians, uh, or sorry, wheelchair user self-defense situations, you have a higher probability that may be happening. The most reliable handguns generate enough power from each individual cartridge firing to keep the gun cycling despite a certain amount of grit. If you're caliber is not strong enough, it's not going, it's, there's, a, there's a relatively low point, a relatively low threshold at which the gun will um, cease to function uh, because it's got water in it or in the other things I mentioned, just from being knocked out of your chair and now you've got dirt in your gun, a little bit of dirt in your gun. So bear that in mind, lower calibers, there's the problems you're going to run into. You're going to run into that with 380, I promise. Okay. I mean, you can make an argument that 22 long rifle penetrates deep enough that it causes certain categories of wounded ballistics to be considered sufficient. You can make that argument. People use 22 long rifle in self-defense. It has been done. Um, try show me anything that runs super reliably with 22 long rifle. Anything. So that's the flip side of the problem. Okay, so you, you, there's, there's a balance with all of these things we have going on. It's going to be you know, a lot of the other things that I discussed too. Um, someone asked specifically about lasers on handguns. So one of the big argument, one of the, the primary arguments for uh, these days for putting a red dot sight on a concealed carry handgun is the single focal plane um, uh, aiming at the, the acquisition for your eye for your targeting reticle with, at one focal plane. Um, and it allows you to focus on the threat. The same argument can be applied to lasers. Um, they work. And for those reasons, it's really good, but you have to keep the, you have to really understand the nuance of it. It's harder to find holsters for them. Um, it's hard enough for a wheelchair user anyways finding your, finding your lasers. So if you're going to use it, they do work, and I will say that you have the added benefit if you have to do one of these weird shooting positions like I've mentioned. Um, maybe you can't bring it all the way up to your eye. Maybe you have some kind of issue where you can't bring it up to your eye anyway. There's a lot of reasons why they're not a bad thing. Um, focusing on the threat is something that you're psychologically going to do anyway if you've never been in that experience, that level of violence. So don't let someone turn you off from that uh, because you're in a store and someone's telling you that you need this or that. That's the point of these videos in the end is to say, to help you understand maybe some variables you haven't considered yet because you're new to the lifestyle. So don't let someone who's never, you know, sat in a wheelchair tell you you need this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment. You've got to go find for yourself, but I can you know, uh, hopefully help you find some stuff that is going to be better for certain circumstances and worse for other circumstances. So, another question was round in the chamber or not. Now, the, a lot of these questions have to do with philosophy. Um, I understand that people who are new to carry have a lot of apprehensions, uh, whether it's about doing violence to another person, you want another step, say you want a safety to click to make sure you don't accidentally shoot somebody you're not supposed to, um, whether it's racking a slide or whatever. I understand all of the arguments behind Condition 3 carry, that's what that's called, keeping the um, a loaded magazine in, no round in the chamber. You can keep the arguments for them, I understand. 
again, my problem with the sort of stuff that requires two-handed hand manip two -handed manipulation is that there's a high chance that you're gonna need one hand to manipulate the wheelchair. Um, there's an even higher chance that you're going to need the other hand to keep someone off of you or somehow manage your environment um, with your off hand. Um, or you're just in that position where you can only use one hand to punch out and get the most accurate shot. Either way, if you're in a wheelchair, my argument is you have a much higher probability of having to fire one-handed. If you've got to rack the slide and you can't get the other hand up to get it, that means you have to rack the slide off of something else. Um, whether it's your wheelchair or your holster or something. Can you do that? Yes. Can you train to a high enough degree where that's less of an issue or no, almost no issue? Yes. Just bear in mind it's way faster, it's way simpler to just carry with a round in the chamber. Um, okay, so holster nuance. I'm trying to remember all of these. Holster nuance. There was another question about the. I, I mentioned, you know, holster position. That there's a lot. There's going to be a lot that holster position has a lot to do with wheelchair injury and wheelchair type. Um, holster material matters a lot too. And I need to expand on a particular comment I made, but the general question was leather versus kydex. In our experience, running a bunch of different holsters, people with leather holsters have more issues than people who had run kydex holsters. That said, um, I realize there's a comfort issue. Kydex is not generally comfortable to wear. There's higher quality uh, Kydex out there. There's stuff that's covered in, you know, like a suede material to not rub against the skin as much. But at the end of the day, you're basically sitting on this thing all day. And it can cause problems. I use all Kydex, um, but I can stretch. I can take stuff off. You know, I can move around in ways that someone with a spinal cord injury cannot do, do as easily, especially throughout the day if you're concealing um, or if you need to keep that gun hidden throughout the day if you have a day job or something. So, yes, leather is going to be way more comfortable. Some of the places we've run into issues with those is maybe drawing with it. So if you carry, say, a uh, strong side hip carry, trying to get around and grab the gun with the off hand um, because you've ended up on the ground um, or some other odd circumstance. Uh, in general, especially with higher quality holsters that are you know, stiffer, they really grab onto the gun well like you want them to. They have that retention that you need to maintain the gun despite being thrown from the chair. Tend to gun, grab the gun at odd angles. Uh, and I'm not speaking for any particular holster company. That's just a general experience. If you find one that works without that issue, cool. Um, I've had the most success with Kydex. Kydex is generally, you can find some really cheap Kydex options that are really going to hold onto the gun well. So if you're not really sure what's, what's going to work out, you'll be able to swap holsters generally a lot cheap for a lot lower budget than switching for, uh, between leather because cheap leather is not something you really want to do. It's not going to hold onto your gun well. When you break the leather in, it's going to warp, and you can possibly get a piece of the material in. You can have a negligent discharge by getting a piece of the material in the trigger guard. There's other issues with it. Um, so you, know, you really got to spend money on leather for it to work well. Um, I did say that uh, hybrid holsters don't work well. What I mean by that is, generally speaking, um, and I've tried several of the name brand companies that make them, the holsters that have a leather backing and a uh, kydex front or a hard plastic front, their retention tends to suck. And for whatever reason, I don't know why the the, the companies I tried they the they use the probably the worst clips out there. Those cheap uh, sheet steel, spring steel clips. Those are so easy to break. That said. My go-to holster company, Gunfighters Inc., has a hybrid holster out there. I've not tried it yet. Um, and they're kind of, I, I consider them um, 
far in the lead in many in overhead most of the most of the Kydex makers most of um, any holster company as far as the re, out of the box retention goes they kind of beat most people so they've probably figured out whatever issues going on with that that being said I have never not, again not tried it but that's what I mean by hybrid holsters there's other types of hybrid holsters there's I all leather shell um, holsters that have a kydex insert around the trigger guard that have really good retention. Um, I can't think of some of the brands off the top of my head. I want to say Galco made one at one point. I don't know if they still do. Um, but uh, I've only tried one of them, but they tend to work really well. I know uh, some people who have them, they, they work exceptionally well. And they're super comfortable because they're leather. So maybe look at that. Um, but again, not many people I know from making them, so options. Um, so carry position. I'm going to be super general about this. Um, carrying in front of your body or carrying a part of your body that's more side oriented. That would generally be, so you, shoulder carry would be one side oriented. Um, more or less. Uh, hip carry is definitely one side favored. Small of the back is going to be one side favored. Cross draw is kind of going to be one side favored, um, unless you have you know, some kind of shoulder articulation issue. I mean, especially if you do. Um, something that's more center of the body is going to be appendix carry, Alaskan carry, modified Alaskan, fanny pack carry. Those are all more or less the center of the body. So this is what's these are some things that are that I'm trying to be as categorical as possible. Retention classically is going to be easier for center of the body. Now I'm going to make some combative videos where I'm going to start off on the ground and I'm going to have a gun with a training barrel in it and uh, several of my guys one at a time are going to try to pin me to the ground without getting my gun out and we're going to work on weapon retention. And I'm going to show you some options that work some of the time and that being like a worst case scenario for a wheelchair user. Um, you've got the gun out prematurely and someone, now it's a fight for the gun and you're on bottom on the ground. Really crappy day. There are some kind of um, mechanical reversals that you can maybe hope to get a shot or two off in those circumstances. I'm going to do, do some videos to show that, to kind of highlight the point. Um, but center of the body, yes, you have better retention and you can access generally better with both hands because you don't know which hand you might need to use the firearm from. Now, if it's strong side, if you have a str you have one side favored for your carry, you can always pull the gun, switch hands, and then manage your wheelchair or whatever you have to do. That is an option too. Um, the argument also there's also an argument to be made that yes, I may have better retention in the center of my body, but you know, for me, where I have a grappling capacity, like I said, uh, I've had the gun jammed up when it's in the center of my body. That's why I carry on my hip. And if I am grappling, I can actually use the ground and gravity to pin my gun if I don't want it snatched prematurely. Um, that may also be an option for an SCI. I can't speak for them. Uh, maybe able to pin the gun, maybe roll a little bit and pin the gun to, as a weapon retention technique while keeping somebody off of you. Um, just recognize that those are fundamentally different um, retention strategies. Uh, so bear that in mind when you're looking at why you're, gonna, you're possibly going to carry on the hip or in the front of your body. The other obviously being you know easy access to either hand. So I'm not saying one way or the other. Obviously I favor hip carry and I've said why. I can't put that on anybody else. So, there it is. Um, there's been a little bit of backlash about mounting stuff to the wheelchair, and a lot of it has to do with situational awareness, and, you know, you, I'll see him coming, or this other stuff, or if I'm knocked out of my chair, I'll grab my gun as I fall and take it with me, or another stuff. It's I've tried all this, okay? I, You'll see in, in, in future videos where I let guy you know I let my guys like hey get me out of my wheelchair, they're gonna get me out of my wheelchair. Um, 
I can try mounting one to the chair and I will show you if you're open carrying mounted to your chair maybe you can pull that off real quick maybe again it's not something I want to bet on now I will say that there's other stuff there's other stuff I advocate having especially for wheelchair users I understand the arguments about having a free-handed light for general civilian safety. It's bulky. It's not practical for a lot of people. I understand, despite the massive advantage of it, not just in a fight. You don't wait to you're in a fight to pull the flashlight out. That's my main argument. Have a flashlight with you because if it's dark outside, just have it in your hand already. Have it in your off hand. If you're right, if you're right hand dominant, your gun's on your right side. Carry it in your left hand. Just walk around with it. It's not a weapon. If someone pops out with you know pops out at you, pop them in the face with it. But there's so much proactive stuff you can do with a flashlight when it's dark outside. Now, if you're a wheelchair user, having a flashlight mounted to your chair, that's a Gunfighters Inc. sheath I had made for my belt. I broke it because that's what I do is break stuff. Um, but instead of fixing it, I just grounded it. I just ground it down, and I used a couple of uh, pipe clamps and mounted it to the frame of my wheelchair. I took, you know, I took it off because I'm gonna. I'm moving. I'm, at, I'm putting a water bottle container, and I'm moving stuff around. But so it's off right now. But this is something you could mount to the outside of your chair because it's not an instant access thing. And if someone's already got hands on you, you're you're less concerned about threat identification. Um, but this is one of those extraneous tools you can have mounted to your chair, and you're not we're not really concerned about weight or digging into your side or anything like that in your belt line. Um, so I'm all about putting extra gear on your chair or having a backup of some kind. Like I've said before, having your backup gun or have, you know, if you can have two guns, have, have an extra gun on your chair. I don't, I don't care, but you've got to have a primary source of self-defense on your body. Um, so in response to extra stuff, yes, I mount mean, a light to your wheelchair. You know, have it there so you pull it out, check stuff. Whether it's a, something more administrative or you know you're scanning the area for threats, um, you're coming up on a Try not to dive into a rabbit hole, because parking lots are rabbit hole anyway. But, ra but parking lots for wheelchair folks are a bottomless rabbit hole. So, I'm just gonna say, parking lots are inherently dangerous. They're especially dangerous for people in wheelchairs because you have a long transfer time between transition area and your steel cage of a car. So, being able to check your environment beforehand is even more important. So he who asked that question, yes, supporting gear all day long on the wheelchair. Um, at some point, I'll do a video about what I keep on my chair. I'm basically a rolling gear cart. I have probably, not exaggerating, my wheelchair probably weighs 70 pounds with all the gear I carry. But I live in the country and I carry a lot of weird gear too. Cordage, stuff to pull my wheelchair out of the mud, spare tires, all kinds of crap. So it's not just you know, tactical gear. Most of it's not. Um, some of it is. So, wheelchair stuff, big gun versus small gun. Because I did mention keeping a small gun on your person, big gun on the wheelchair. As long as you have a gun on your person, I'm okay with that. Um, as far as big gun versus small gun when you're just starting to carry, so general question, if you're buying your first gun, big gun or small gun, big gun... Okay, so big guns are be easier to shoot, smaller guns are be harder to shoot. Why? Why is a hammer easier or hard to swing? If you're trying to pound a nail and it's not working, do you get a smaller hammer and swing harder? Do you get a bigger hammer and you know not swing as hard? Let the hammer do the work. The bigger the tool, the more the energy is going to be transferred to the tool unless to your hands, the more leverage you're going to have against the recoil. It's a pretty simple mathematical equation. In the case of handguns or any firearm, it's an exponential function because it's about the power of the springs. So the longer the spring, the further it has to travel, the more time and energy is put into the gun for eating that recoil. Bigger guns are harder to conceal. They're bulkier against the body. They, they're, they um, wear on the body more. Smaller guns have smaller capacity. They're much harder to shoot. There are subcom. 
with newer spring technology, smaller guns have gotten easier to shoot, but they're still harder to shoot. Um, this is compounded exponentially with the whole revolver versus semi-auto argument. Um, I think that argument is generally put to, get, put to bed for most people. However, and that, that whole argument about, you know, revolvers having a U-shaped learning curve, you know, um, if you don't really know how to use guns, they're, they're better, but the more you train, the less you really get out of them until you come back up on the other end of the, you know, the expert curve. That still holds true. However, because of the higher potential for a grappling situation over the gun in the wheelchair situation, there's a stronger argument argument for revolver carry because it's harder to jam up in a grappling situation. The flip side of that argument is obviously round count. You have the volume of fire, fire argument again. Um, you also so I've heard this argument that you know there's a scramble over the gun with a with a revolver. You can just keep pulling the trigger and it'll keep going with a semi-auto. It'll fire one round. And it'll jam. That's kind of true, except you can absolutely grab a revolver cylinder and it won't turn as you're trying to pull the trigger. With that round, with that mental math, you have a zero round count with a revolver and you have a single round count with a semi-auto. So I don't really see that as the argument. I'm talking more of a um, contact shot a, um, mentality. So if you're pressing the gun into somebody, you have a f lower chance of um, upsetting the operation of the gun. Here's another argument. Um, for a time, when that hand was still jacked up and basically a cast, I could not, uh, because of the amount of dexterity I had in this hand, perform a semi-auto reload with any kind of speed whatsoever. Um, and yes, I could have holstered and did you know these uh, modified reloads that one practices. Uh, when you know you simulate an arm going down, or you're you know carrying a baby, or whatever, you put the gun back in the holster, you put a fresh magazine, you rack it on some hard surface on your body. You can do that. Um, where I was way faster was taking at the time I had I think a Smith and Weston TR8, it's an eight shot full size revolver, and with this hand though I couldn't rack a slide or really manipulate a magazine, I could hold the cylinder of the revolver and do a speed reload and then close the cylinder pull, and transfer hands much quicker than I could do a one hand, a modified one-handed uh, reload on a semi-auto. So while this hand was going through recovery, the, um, that revolver was way faster for me. That said, it was an eight-shot revolver and it was a full-size handgun. So it was less recoil than you'd run into, say, like a J-frame revolver from Smith & Wesson. Um, small revolvers just are hard to shoot. If you already have dexterity issues, you're not going to want to practice with it a lot. If you don't want to practice with it a lot, you're not going to get good at running the very gun that's harder to run in the first place. So, there, are, there is more of an argument to be made revolvers versus semi-auto for the wheelchair user. Um, I still think semi-auto, most of those can be overcome by um, uh, most people training harder with a semi-auto. The legitimate issues that come up with hand-to-hand -hand grappling in and out of the wheelchair. So, take it for what it's worth. Um, yes, the argument exists. I still have trouble with it. Unless we're talking about a manual of arms in which the manual of arms just makes more sense. Or you live in bear country or something, you know, you need a heavy caliber gun, you're more likely to run into bears than people. I've gotten that argument too. That's outside the frame of this discussion. Um, so I think that's all the questions that were generated so far um, off of the first video, a little bit more nuanced. Um, 
there, there were more specific questions. For example, I mentioned the PX4 and that there were things to get it to run more. That's true of any gun. If you, whatever handgun you, you pick, there's going to be inherent weak points about the mechanics of it, and there's going to be inherent um, strong points. So, via training or you know mechanical ma manipulation, um, if you know that individual about the PX4, I, I can I can shoot you an email about that. Um, it has to do with with greasing versus oiling some components and greasing other components uh, to increase reliability and extend the, the life of the handgun. That's what I meant specifically about that. Um, there was one other one that was polymer versus metal frame. And this kind of goes to revolver versus semi-auto too. You know, the revolver, you're eating all of the recoil because it's a solid piece of metal. There's nothing about the mechanics to help absorb the recoil except maybe the weight of the gun if you're talking about a full-size revolver. The discussion generally stems in this category is that metal framed guns um, have a little bit more recoil than um, polymer framed handguns. I have found that to be generally true. That said, the, SP, the CZ SP-01 is probably the lowest recoil of just about anything I've ever shot. Um, so that's not conclusive, but the argument is that the, hand, the uh, frame flexes as it's firing in addition to the recoil spring eating some of the recoil. In general, I find that to be true. Um, so when we're talking about one-handed firing and recoil management being even more important, to answer that question, yes, that's generally been my experience. Um, so I think that's all the questions. If you have any specific questions, again, you can email me, wheelchairgunfighter at gmail.com. Um, this is not, again, meant to be comprehensive. I'm going to do a comprehensive video on what we consider tactical imperatives and how they link together in a systemic manner for um, general success in the dynamic of a fight and why each one of them is important. When you look at it from that perspective, you can really see why it's important that we are capable of having high force options in the wheelchair. Um, because without those high force options, we can't overcome a lot of the circumstances in the after the initial ambush. So I'm going to do a comprehensive video on that to, to you know, really qualify a lot of the efficiency arguments I'm making. Um, so I'm trying to be general, but you know, the the very specific questions I I can answer on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, but for now, if you have some more categorical questions. Um, you know, and that can be in the frame of this category versus this category. I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, general gear reviews. People have asked me about, you know, reviewing a specific piece of equipment. I know I've done that before, um, and I can do that for any specific piece of gear that I own, but I'm not going out of my way to acquire a piece of gear to gear test it. I don't care about that. Um, I will test stuff for myself, but I will generally dismiss something if it's not in the optimal range for me. Um, or I should say for wheelchair users in general, if it's just not something that's not really working, I'm not going to pay it a whole lot of mind. So I'm not going to say, hey, I went out of my way to test this piece of gear. I just don't do that. Um, I don't have time for it. My general concern is tactical awareness and the more academic direction of violence in general, how it relates to wheelchair users, but society at large. So if you have a categorical question, so that would be, you know, polymer frame versus metal frame. That's a category. That's a rather nuanced category, but that's a category nonetheless. Revolvers versus semi-autos, that's a category. So if you have questions like that, I'm happy to do a video about it if I can. Um, send me an email. Um, otherwise, thank you for watching.